Standing here in the midst of all, oh, we raise you up with our praise, and as we worship, and as we worship you, your throne, and as we worship. And as we were worshiping your throne, and as we worship, and as we were worshiping your throne, come, Lord Jesus, and take your place. And as we worship you. And as we worship you, your throne. And as we worship, and as we worship you, your throne. And as we worship, and as we worship you, your throne. Come, Lord Jesus, and take your place. Jehovah, we praise you. Jehovah, we praise you. We Oh, 
have drums this evening, but we're going to clap our hands to the glory of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord, most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 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 Most high. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Just run into it, and they are saying, The name of the Lord is the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saying, The name of the Lord. Of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. Say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, most high. The name of the Lord is the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run into and they are saying the name of the Lord is the name of the Lord is a strong tower just run into and they are saved. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. 
that your prayer this evening? Say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart. Lord, I want to see you. We want to see you, Lord. I want to see you. Say, silence the noise in my heart. Silence the noise in my heart, Lord. And open my eyes. Open the eyes of my heart. Say, I want to see you. I want to see you, Lord. I want to see you. Say, silence the noise in my heart. Silence the noise in my heart, Lord. Say, open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart. Say, I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. to prayer not just song upon our lips I want us to turn it to prayer that the Lord will open our eyes of understanding as we have come to study his word as we come to look at the pages of the scripture the Lord will open our eyes of understanding he will open our heart in the name of Jesus let's come before him with our heart let's come before him that Lord we surrender ourselves to you we give ourselves unto you. We ask, O oh God, that be revelation of your word. Even as you look at the pages of your scripture, we ask that there will be a light of God that will shine upon our heart in the name of Jesus. Let's begin to tell the Lord, that Lord, as we have come to draw from your fountain, that Lord, that, that you will fill us to overflowing in the name of Jesus. As we have come to drink of the water of life, that God, that you will fill us in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We bless your holy name. For in Jesus' name, we pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of our God. Let's have our seat. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, first of all, let me say uh, to every one of us that is here this evening that you are welcome to the Bible study of tonight. And I pray that, you know, as we look at the word of God, that God will, you know, he will satisfy us with his word. You know, that we will not just be coming for coming sake, but there will be revelation of the word of God, that through the word of God, the word of God will feed us. And we'll be filled, you know, with, you know, with the word of God in our life. So we are going to do a part two of what we started last week. But tonight I'm going to take it in a different direction. Actually, there are two songs I, I would like all to sing just to prepare our heart. You know, as I point out some of the things that we discuss, And one of the things that you know, became very evident to me, you know, why, you know, um, we get to a point where we begin to debate about, you know, take this or, or don't take this. It's because as you look at the message that comes from the pupil, you know, 
the message of consecration are not popular again in the most pulpit. And the reason why I said that is that as you look at the word of God and also some of the people that God used during their time, you know, more often than not, God would tell them that separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them. Or if there's one that God is going to use to, you know, to, to, to bring deliverance to the people of God, and God will give a specific instruction. You remember that uh, the, the priest in those days, the people that serve before God and his people, and God will tell, give them instruction how they should appear, their manners of life, and how they should behave. Why? Because what? They are priests of God. And because also what? The Bible said they are consecrated unto the Lord. And the Bible says that God has made us priest and king unto himself. So how can our whole be different? So as we look at, uh, you know, uh, in what we started last week, I'll be looking at, I'll be focusing more on, uh, you know, we said that the best recommendation is for us to abstain. But let's look at the reasons for abstinence, which we also find in the word of God, you know, like people that God used in the scripture. God will tell them that, don't do this, don't do this. For what? For a reason. And it's good that we look at the reasons why God gave them such instruction. So majorly, uh, my focus, our focus is going to be on that. But just like I said in summary, it's because the message of consecration is not popular in most, most uh, on the pulpit. And that's why you see people go to the extent of beginning to, uh, uh, to, to argue whether I should take this or not this. But as you look at the way God dealt with people in the past, and when God told them, I want to make use of you. God will give them a specific instruction. This is the way I expect you because you are consecrated unto me. And that's why the Bible will tell us that be holy for the Lord is low, for, for God is holy. Actually, that is the song I actually came to my mind that, see that, uh, that says that uh, it said, for, uh, it said be, holy, be holy for your Lord God is holy. You must sanctify yourself and be holy for I am holy you must be holy unto me for I the Lord am holy you must sanctify yourself and be holy for I am holy, you must sanctify yourself and be holy. For I am holy, praise the Lord. So quickly, I'm going to read. Uh, I would love, love us to sing this song, Call Unto Holiness. But I will only read the wordings for us. And if you can shoot it on the screen for us, I will really appreciate that. That's a song titled called on the old in holiness. So I will just read the wordings and just to prepare our heart as we look at our topic today. So the title of this song is called Call Unto Holiness. And the first stanza says like this: say, Call unto holiness, church of God, for chase of Jesus, redeemed by his blood, call from the world and its idols to flee, call from the bondage of sin to be free. And the second sentence says, call unto holiness, children of light, walking with Jesus in garments of white, remained unsolid, untarnished with sin, God's Holy Spirit abiding within. Then sentence three says, call unto holiness, Praise is their name. This blessed secret to faith now made plain. Not our own righteousness, but Christ within. Living and reigning and saving from sin. 
Then stands out verses, call unto holiness, glorious thought, up from the wilderness wanderings brought, out from the shadows and darkness of night, into the Canaan of perfect delight. And the last stanza says that, call unto holiness, bride of the Lamb, waiting the bridegroom's returning again, lift up your heads, for the day draweth near, when is beauty the king shall appear. You know, uh, there is no serious Christian that will look at the wordings of these songs that will not sit down and, you know, take a stock of your life. That how am I supposed to live to be able to please the master? And so the question of, you know, whether you take this or take this will not be something that we begin to debate about. And that is why we are going to look at some scriptures People in the scripture that God, you know, God gave instruction, specific instruction. And the question is, why did God give such instruction today? And so if we begin to look ourselves in that light, we can begin to understand why, you know, it is important for us, you know, to, you know, to abstain, to abstain. And the first scripture I'm going to read it's Luke chapter 1, verse 15. You know, we are going to deliberate it together. Luke chapter 1, verse 15. Can we have it on the screen? Luke chapter 1, verse 15. And it's read, For it will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. You know, for me, if you look at this passage of the scripture, of course, in many other passages that you see, it will talk about drunkenness. Praise the Lord. But as you read this particular, uh, this particular verse, it's very straightforward. There's no doubt about it. Praise the Lord. I will stay together. You know? So, let's look at this. The instruction is very straightforward. There's no doubt about whether you take a little until you are drunk. But you also know that before you are drunk, you have to drink. So, in this instance, it says that, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. Even try to categorize it. Probably there's some wine that, you know, but don't even drink it at all. But it will be filled with the spirit from the mother's womb. I want us to just take a moment and think about that. Why will God give us instruction? Why will God give such instruction? Then I will read the second passage of the scripture. And the reason why I read this passage is that as you, you can begin to look at this passage and the other passage that people normally refer to, that say, oh, you can drink a little, but not unto drunkenness. So, you can put two of them side by side and begin to see what is in the mind of God. What is God saying? Let's read John chapter, uh, Jude, Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. I'm going to start to read from verse 4. Just Jesus chapter 13. We start our reading from verse 4. Can we have it on the screen? And I read. He said, now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink. And not to eat anything unclean. And I think this is very clear enough. And I don't know why people don't always refer to these two passages of the scripture. You know, to say, like, oh, you know, you are debating about this. But what about this passage of the scripture? You know, people don't often refer to this. Am I right? They don't often refer to this. But the one they will refer to is the one that says, okay, until you are get to a point that to stupor. But this is direct. 
And the question is, why will God give such instruction? Why? If you also read Leviticus chapter 10, let's start to read from verse 8. Before we read that, let's look at uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 34. Okay, let's look at Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8 to 11. Uh, from verse 8, yeah. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, verse 9, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. You nor your sons with you. When you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die, it shall be a statue forever throughout your generation. Let's begin to think, why will God give such instruction? Probably I should throw it open at this time. Let's begin to now discuss it. So why will God give instruction like this? And we are looking at it at this in the light of in other passages of the scriptures that say that okay, you know, drunkenness and drunkenness. So why we got why we got give instruction like this? Uh, somebody there. So we are free to contribute, you know, just to hear our thought. It's not working. Okay. Praise the Lord. Okay. Hallelujah. I think I just need to wake up. Um, let's look at First Peter five eight. Okay. First Peter, Peter five eight. First Peter five. First Peter five eight. If you have. First Peter five eight. First Peter five eight. Yes. So First Peter five eight says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour." So, my understanding is to be sober. To be vigilant means, you know, if I if I look at it as a soldier, if I look at it as being militant, um, you have to stay awake. I remember my days in the military. Um, when you're on watch, you know, everybody else is asleep, but certain amount of people we go through 24-hour rotation, most especially. In danger, uh, in dangerous terrain, like in the Middle East. So, if if we as if I as a former military person understand the importance of being being awake, being vigilant, so also we as Christians, you know, the Bible is saying that we should. God is saying we should have the focus. The focus of us being on this earth. It's not just to make money, to serve God, and to enjoy. The focus is heaven. So we have to have a heavenly mindset. So in order to have a heavenly mindset, you have to be sober. You have to be vigilant because the devil is not playing. We are a moving target for the devil, believe it or not. So, you know, yeah, last week we talked about, you know, this debate about you drink, you know, get drunk, blah, 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 and all that. But this, for me, drags it home. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. So if, if nothing else, if nothing else, just to have an heavenly mindset, be focused. You know, like, if you want to get something done, you have to be focused. Because if your mind is divided, you can't get to where you're going. So I guess that's why God's saying, be sober, be vigilant. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that comment. You know, in other words, it means maintain your discipline. 
we have to maintain our discipline, most especially as people that are on the way, uh, you know, way of uh, way of holiness, way of salvation. You have to maintain your discipline. You cannot lose your guard. You cannot behave anyhow. There is a way. There is a pattern that you have to behave in the kingdom. You know, most of all, if you have heaven as your goal, you cannot live to please yourself. You have to please. You have to live to please the one that has called you. You know, so that means to maintain our discipline. Praise the Lord. Okay, go ahead, ma. Just, just also to add to it, there are two types of pain in life. Um, the pain of regret or the pain of discipline. So we have to choose. Which one do you want to deal with? Do you want to deal with regret or do you want to go ahead and take the discipline? Praise the Lord. Okay, so let's get back to, you know, our, those two passages of scripture that I've read. You know, is to look at those passages of scriptures carefully and closely and use it to compare to what does God expect of us. If in those days, God could tell the people, this is what I expect of you. Let me let me read out some of the things I just you know some of the things I wrote down here, and also as you look at those passages of the scripture. Now, if you look at those you know uh, the passage and also the people that you know it applied to that God was speaking to, it was because God wanted to use them for something, and so they are consecrated to God and also to His service. There are people that they are dedicated to God and also dedicated for God's use. Let's take the case of John the Baptist, the first one that we read. Because God was going to use him mightily. And God told, you know, God told the parent before he was ever born that because I am going to use this man for my glory, this and this are the things I expect of him. And when it came to the time of uh, the judges too, when he was also uh, talking about the birth of uh, Samson, because God was, was going to use him as a deliverer, and God gave an express command, this and this he must not do. Because what? He was consecrated for God's use, and also he was also to be consecrated unto God. And what, and what did Romans chapter 12 tell us? He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do what? Present yourself as a living sacrifice unto God. So, we can see there's no difference. Because we have to be consecrated and dedicated to God for his use. And if you are going to be somebody that is going to live along that pattern in that life, lifestyle, you know, you have no business to do it, you know, whether I take this, I think, because all that you are concerned about is to please the one that has called you. And that's why when God was talking to the priest of those days, God told them that you must be holy for I, the Lord, I am holy. You know? And you know, as I ponder on, you know, on the, the way the, the, the priests of those days, the way they conduct their service, and also what God expects of them. And I ask myself, that, what is the difference between the priests and the, and, the, uh, and, the, you know, and the people? Because God specifically told them that these people must be consecrated to me. But in our own time, in our own days, there are no special priests because God has made every one of us priests and kings. And so we are to abide by the same rule. It's not only the pastor that's supposed what, to be consecrated. It's not only the pastor that's supposed to be dedicated for God's use. It is what? As long as you are born of God and the spirit of God is living inside of you. The Bible says what? He has made us kings and priests. And so, we live 
by the same rule. And so, if you are the priest of God today, and if God could tell the priests of those times how they need to live, how much more in our own time. The other passage of the scripture I also want to bring up is, uh, you know, where Jesus was telling them that in those days, you know, that, this time, that, that Christ has come to, you know, to raise the bar. You know, in those days, they would say, an eye for an eye. Or, um, when Jesus was talking to the audience, he said that if you, if you look upon a woman, already what? You have committed uh, the action. So, you can see that the bar has been raised. The bar is very high. And that is why those people that will go to the Old Testament and be, oh, the Bible talk about drunkenness and all that. If they consider what Jesus said in our own time, the bar is high. The standard of holiness, God expects more from us. Because what? Christ has died. And there is a grace that is available. There is a grace that is available unto us. In their own time, of course, they tried to do it by their own power, you know, by, you know, slaughtering animals to cover their sin. But in our own time, Christ has died for us. And the Bible, and, and God used him as an example. You know, he said that the, the prince of this world came and he found nothing in me. So what he demonstrated is that even as a man, you can live a life that will please God. And that's what they also demonstrated. By living a life without sin. That he has come to grip all the grace that we can live to be able to please God. Praise the Lord. So, the first point is that because we are consecrated to God, we are dedicated to God and for his use. We are dedicated to God for God's service. Reason why we need to abstain. And the Bible talks about what? We are God's temple. We are the temple of God. So you have to keep the temple clean. You don't allow things that will destroy the temple to enter it. You know? So, any other uh, comment? Okay. I also remember, you know, one of those, uh, one of our, you know, our Bible study, and and our pastor was, you know, uh, teaching on, uh, I've forgotten the topic, but there are things that he mentioned, I, I did not forget, I, did, I didn't for, forget our calling as a Christian. And that's why I you know, read the wordings of that song to us, called unto holiness. As a Christian, we are called to holiness. We are also called to what? To heavenly life. While we are heart here, we are called unto holiness. But also beyond that is that we are called into what? Into an heavenly life. Because we know that after we have done the will of God and we have pleased God here, everything does not just end here. Our calling is to be with the Lord and to reign with him. And that's why, you know, the Bible says that Christ is coming for a church that is what? Spotless without wrinkle. A church that is spotless without wrinkle. So if you are going to keep your garment of righteousness to be spotless, you will not meddle with the things that the world are debating about. You know? In fact, I tried to do a, a, a little digging into, you know, uh, the wine that Jesus, you know, uh, turned into, you know, I mean, from, from water to wine. Of course, you know, there are many comment and contradiction here and there. But the summary of it of it all is that we know that Jesus will not give wine that will intoxicate. And that is the bottom line. 
And he himself will not take a wine that will intoxicate. And that's it. He won't take it. Neither will he give it to people to take. Because the Bible says that woe is unto that man that giveth his neighbor strong, uh, strong drink. I think that is found in uh, uh, the Proverbs. So, the, the Bible has already you know, pronounced that woe is that man that will give another person strong drink. So, Jesus wouldn't have given those people wine that will intoxicate them. You know, whether they, whether I contain, what, whatever they call it, but what we know, what we can conclude is that Jesus will never give those people wine that will intoxicate. And that is the summary of it all. So, the, the scholar can debate it, but we know as who, uh, you know, as, as a son of God and also uh, as the Messiah, he will not give people wine that will intoxicate. And for me, that settles everything. That settles everything. Um, so, I've said that uh, we are called to a life of holiness. We are called to a heavenly life. And also, the standard of holiness is higher. Jesus came and what? He has raised the bar for us. And so what is expected of us is a higher level of consecration, higher level of holiness, and also higher level of, uh, you know, a commitment to him. If we are going to please our father, the one that has called us. And I also say that because our temple, our body is the temple of God. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it talks about abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, um, something just came to my mind that those people that talk about, okay, until you are drunk, that's when it becomes a sin. It's like you have a coal of fire and you are sitting on top of it or you are close by it. You are saying, after all, I'm not inside it. Because before you get drunk, you have to drink. Until what? You get to a point that you cannot control yourself. But what we do know is that, you know, drink the, the wine, you know, can be addictive. You know, it can get you to a point that you get so addictive to that if you have not taken it, you don't feel yourself. And of course, when you begin to get to that point, I think something is also wrong too. Because you are now being controlled and being influenced by what you have not taken. And that's why the Bible says, what? Hey, abstain. Abstain from it. Rather being filled with, you know, drunkenness and all that, be filled with the Spirit of God. You know, uh, another point that also came to my mind is uh, the last in uh, Leviticus chapter 10 verse 8 that we read. I want us to read that passage again. You know, I want to point something out. Levit Leviticus chapter 10 verse 8. That the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, verse 9, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. You nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of meeting. I want us to pause a little bit there. You know, some people can say that, you know what? He's saying that when you go to do the service of the Lord, don't go there to drink. But this is the way I look at it. Why should your private life be different from your pulpit life? Why should it be different? Why should my private life be different from the pulpit life? And that is the problem we have today. You know, in most, you know, in most, uh, you know, all around. The private life of the pastor is different from his public life or pulpit life. That's why you have a lot of, you know, uh, you know, is it deceive us, you know, false prophet around. Because what? Their private life does not 
uh, is not commensurate, does not match what is on the pulpit. So if I'm to go by this, and the people that will say that when you go to do the service of the work of God, don't drink. So that means when I'm not doing service unto God, I can see somewhere and just, you know, have it all. Yeah. I think it doesn't speak well. It doesn't speak well. You know, another example that also came to my mind is this. Uh, some people will say that, oh, after I drink it in the corner of my house, you know, I see that I'm drinking it. So what is different between those that sit in their house and those that go to the beer parlor where ah, that person is coming from where they are a drinking place? The only difference is just the location or, but the thing is what the act you are doing is the same thing. And something also came to my mind as I was just thinking about it. That, okay, to make it very clear, it's like somebody that you say that somebody is, uh, you know, is committing adultery. And one will say that because I did it in my own house, and the other one will say because I, in, you went to do it in a what, in an hotel. So what is the difference? It's the same thing. Whether you committed it in a hotel or you do it at the corner of your house, but you are still doing the same act. And so it does not matter whether I was taking it in my bedroom compared to when I go to a drinking beer parlor to take it. So it doesn't matter. But the thing is, you are still doing the same thing. Okay. Oh, come in. Go ahead. I'm just going to comment that the person who is doing it at the corner of their house is actually more in danger. Because you can do as much as you want because in your mind, nobody is watching you. And um, those who go to the beer parlor, at least there are people watching them to say, ah, this one is enough, no more. But for you, there is, you're doing it at the corner of your house. You are actually in more danger because now you, the enemy is just right there waiting on you to fall. So like you said, sir, we got to be very careful. Is the, is, is the same thing, whether you're doing it publicly or whether you're doing it privately. And another thing is this, your life privately is more important than your life publicly because then you're a hypocrite. You come out, you pretend, you're just going through the motion. Let your light so shine that all men may see it and glorify your good, uh, see your good works and glorify your father. Here's the thing. Who's watching at home? Your kids. And those are your first uh, ministry. <laughs> they watch it. They see everything. So whether you're doing it in secret, be aware that there's somebody watching you. Not just God, but your children. Man, praise the Lord. Please have the comment. Well, since this is Bible study, right? Digging deep. So let's Bible. dig deep. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, switch the gear a little bit because um, my, my mind won't rest until this comes out. Okay. Um, first of all, this is a disclaimer for people in the house. Um, I don't drink. I've been exposed to, to all kinds of drink. I've worked in the bureau before. I worked where they produce semen shinap and all that. So I was in the military, you know, and all that. So I was exposed to drinking, but only by the grace of God that I'm saying what I'm saying right now. Let us look at Jesus. Jesus was a Nazarene, right? Yep. By birth. And if we understand what a Nazarene is, that means from birth, you're not supposed to touch alcohol, right? Yes? Yeah. Dead bodies, right. you know, because you're consecrated, you're set apart, right? Okay. This is the argument that Christians that drink, they will always refer to this 
to this thing that, wait a minute, Jesus changed water to wine. And it says that it was actually a strong wine. So what do we, how do we dissect this notion to our fellow brothers? You know, once again, if you're watching me, I don't drink. I'm not encouraging people to drink. But I'm just saying that what, you know, because this will keep coming. This will keep coming because Christians will hammer on this. Like, ah, it's in the Bible. Jesus changed water to wine. So what are we talking about? So once again, my focus is because this is Bible study. We are studying the Bible. We are digging deep. Let us dig into how is it that Jesus, a Nazarene, that's not supposed to touch strong drink, change water into wine. Let's, let's, let's discuss yeah. about this a little bit. Thank you. Let's read the, uh, I think it's in Luke, chapter 7, there about, where Jesus turned water to wine. Let's, let's turn to the passage of the scripture. Let's read it. Chapter 7. Verse 1. Let me put it on the screen. It's good. Let's, let's, you know, let's dice, let's dice it. Uh, verse 2. Let's start from verse 3. Where Jesus turned water to wine is the book of Luke. Okay, while we wait for that, you know, I said that I tried to do a little bit of research. John chapter 2. Okay. You know, I tried to do a little digging into, uh, you know, what, what kind of wine did Jesus uh, turn from water to wine? Of course, in the, those people that commented, both the scholars and all that, it was a kind of a debate. Fermented wine, unfermented wine, or something that is kind of a grape juice. Just telling you some of the things that is in the cell. Okay? So it was a kind of a back and forth and all that. But this is the way I look at it. You look at the, uh, okay, and they ran out of wine, and you see that they have no wine. If you look at, uh, I think in, in, in Proverbs, where I see that a man should not give his neighbor a wine. First of all, I believe that Jesus, the summary, and the, also the way they summarize it, is that Jesus will not give a wine that intoxicates. That's the first thing that, that they, they all uh, kind of agreed on and also summarized that. The kind of wine that was turned from water to wine is not the type that intoxicates because Jesus wouldn't have given wine that, that would make people to be drunk. Then they also followed to say that in some other places where you know, Jesus took uh, a supper and, and he used wine. It's not that kind of wine that intoxicates. So, whichever way you people uh, point to it, but what we know is that Jesus will not take wine that intoxicates. And that is the summary of the whole thing. So, while we look at that, while we, while we ponder on that, okay, do you want to comment? Brad, you want to you want to comment? Yes, sir. Sorry. At that point, it was like forty degrees of alcohol. Uh, where where did you get that? <laughs> where did you get that? No, it's okay. The wine that Jesus drank at Last Supper during the Passover period would be with a certain margin of error, a dense, full-bodied wine with a short aging period, 
with an alcoholic content of 14 degree. But, but you, know, you know, that's very high. Do you know that? You know, oh, <laughs> you know, I told you, you see, it, it, it was a kind of debate. Hold on. It was a kind of debate. Some people took the side, oh, you know, hold on. Some people said like, it's, it's a kind of, you know, uh, it's a kind of strong drink. But some others said that most likely not. And they compare it to grape juice. But the thing is this. You know, as you look at, uh, the way I will look at it is this. I know that Jesus will not break the word of God. Do we all agree that? He will not break the word of God because the word of God has already said that no, that if war is unto that man that give his neighbor strong drink or wine. Can you look for that passage of the scripture for me? Let's quickly read that. Then I will give uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse, uh, I think verse 15 there about. Habakkuk chapter 2. Let's read that. Because it is good to, you know, you got to look at the, uh, you know, the word of God broadly. Just don't take one verse and take it that way. I believe. It's a word to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your blood too, even to make him drunk, that you may look upon his nakedness. So, knowing who Jesus is, we, we, can, we can rightly conclude. One, he will not take, he will not take a while to intoxicate. He will not give to even people to intoxicate. Which is what I come, which is, which is what I also come to believe. I believe that Jesus will not have given a kind of wine that will make men to be drunk. Even when he's taking the last supper, I, be, I believe that he won't have taken the one that will make men or may, even make himself to be drunk. But there are people that will say, you know what, wine is wine, and we can tell you that this is most likely the percentage of people, you know, percentage of, you know, what it contains. You know, they're just giving speculation. But come to think of it also, too. Come to think of it also, too. The manner that, that, God, that God gave the children of Israel can it be the same manner that probably anyone could have prepared? I want us to answer that question. The manner that God gave the children of Israel, can it be any other kind of food or you know, that a man would have prepared? Can it be? Can, can it be? Let me also ask another question. Hold on, hold on. Let me also ask another question so that we can begin to think deep that even if Jesus turned water to wine, it can never be the same wine that you know that we, we are we are known we are known to be. I mean, we all know it can never be the same wine. That's where I'm going to. You know, but the only way they could refer to if if what Jesus turned water to wine, of course, because that's what. You know, uh, it's known when you go to uh, an occasion like that, they take one and things like that. But the one that Jesus turned from water to wine can never be like the one that is manufactured or the one that is, you know, in, uh, that is prepared in the factory. It can never be. That's what I will, I will, I will believe. It can never be. So, yeah, you, you want to say something? Okay. I don't drink, so, but, um, All right. but we, we are Christians, and people come to us, we should be able to have answers. That's right. And, and that's why we're digging deep. In Texas, in the state of Texas, if your alcohol level is 0 0.08, 0 0.08, if the cop stops you, they find that after doing a sobriety test and your alcohol level is 0 0.08, hmm? you get a DUI. 
driving under the influence. Okay, that's one. So, when you go to Costco, for instance, you just go to Costco, Walmart, look through the wine shelves, look at the alcohol level. As far as I, as far as I can recall, the, 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 the lowest alcohol level I've seen was 1% alcohol. For somebody like me, if you dig your finger into that 1% alcohol, I'll be drunk like a skunk. Because my, you know, because my brain don't take alcohol. I, I, you know, like I said, I've been exposed to it. I, you know, so, but when you keep saying that, the alcohol that Jesus, did, you know, Jesus, you know, the miracle that in Cana is not, you know, the, uh, a strong drink. I'm, with science, I'm finding it difficult to, and as a farmer, yeah. I'm finding it difficult to understand because, you know, fruits, fruits, you know, when you leave fruit, grapefruit, yeah. you, we can do a simple experiment. When you leave grapefruit sitting down, for a little bit, for a long time. Fermentation will kick in. And once fermentation kicks in, it becomes strong, strong, strong. And it can intoxicate somebody like me that don't drink, that don't have tolerance for alcohol. So what I'm driving at is, because this is Bible study, because we are Christians, yes, right. because people will come to us, and even Christians struggle with this, we need to be able to have the, a better understanding. Let's not... Let's not, you know, uh, 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 massage it. Let's not bottle it down. Let us dig deep. Like, this is, this is expected. I just gave instances of the law. 0 0.08. You get caught with 0 0.08, you are in trouble. So, the bottom line is, be sober. Be vigilant. Let us pray to God. If it be the will of God, let us, you know, since, since you know, we have heavenly mindset, okay, let us remember this in our daily walk with Christ, our daily walk on this earth. Let's not massage it. Let's not try to say the wine that Jesus, you know, gave them what it is. As far as science is concerned, as far as my knowledge as a farmer is concerned, it was a strong drink. drink. Okay, it was strong. Let's not massage it, but let's pray that God will give us, the, the, you know, the, the power to remain sober and vigilant. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your comment. Uh, okay. I will I'll press it for a little bit, but uh, probably not. Okay. Um, uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I, I believe from my understanding that um, the w wine that Jesus, the water that Jesus turned to wine was alcoholic because it was customary in those days for people to drink wine. It, it's, it was an everyday thing. If we study theology. It's an everyday thing for people to drink wine, especially at such gatherings, right? So, Jesus turning it into wine that was alcoholic, we, we would never honestly know what the percentage of alcohol was, but I believe it was alcoholic because it was better than what they've ever had, and I think there was a message that Jesus was also trying to bring from that, that what he gives is better than what the world would give. And also to look at Luke chapter 1, verse 15, um, when the verse said that he would not drink wine or strong drink. Yeah. Um, it was referring to Judas, um, sorry, to um, John, John the Baptist, the Baptist yeah. right. And um, the other verse, too, was also referring to Samson. That's so right. there, there isn't really any concrete point as to where the Bible says, do not drink wine for believers. It, it says pretty much don't be drunk, that we should be sober. So people that God wants to use personally, he requires them to be sober. But does okay. it fly for every Christian? Okay, good. That's where my Let's question is. Let's take it from that point. 
from, yeah. I want to take it from the last point that you said. People that God wants to use. You know, when I started, I started by saying that because the message of consecration is no longer uh, popular on the pulpit. Because these people, they are what? Consecrated people for God's use and purpose. Right? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Did you hear what I said now? I said, these people that you've just mentioned, they are people you know, that are consecrated for God's use and purpose. Then what should our, what should our life be then? What should our life be? If not to, to be people that are ready to be used of God. And I gave a, a thought in a top passage of the scripture where we read of the priest in those days. Where God specifically tell them, don't do this. Why? Because what? There are people that is consecrated to God. Okay? Because what? They are priests. Right? And I said that in our own time, God has made you and I priest and king unto him. So if you are to follow that order, if you are to follow that order, then you also need to abide by, you know. And also if you want to be someone that is, you know, consecrated and ready to be used of God, then why should our life be different from this? Hold on. I'm just trying to, you know, trying to pop our mind up. So why should our, our life be different from this kind of people? And I say that probably in our own time, the way we think, oh, it is the pastors that are supposed to be consecrated and dedicated. No. Because God has made every one of us priests and kings to him. And so if a pastor needs to be consecrated, and you know, uh, dedicated to God, then we also are supposed to follow suit because what we have all been made king and priest unto God. And so, when you look at it from that point of view, you know there will be no need for you know this and this or, or you know uh, arguing about drinking or not drinking because if you are ready to be used of God, and God has said, you know what. I want you to be dedicated to me. I want you to be consecrated to me. And you want to live that life. Then this should be our example. This should be what should be our focus. In fact, there is, uh, in, in the book of Jeremiah, the Bible talks about the children of Rechab. Is it Rechabite? Praise the Lord. John chapter, uh, Jeremiah chapter 35. Talk about the children of Rechabite. You know, the Bible says what? They, you know, they, uh, no, Jeremiah chapter 35, the children of Rechabite. You know, the Bible commended them for it because what? They, they move away. They, you know, they kind of abstain from strong drink, from drinking wine. Can we put it up? Jeremiah, I think it's Jeremiah chapter 35. Let's quickly read that. Verse, four, verse 6, Jeremiah 35, verse 6. Sorry, I'm going to allow, I'm going to give audience. Okay. But we should read from verse 5. Let's read from verse 5. And I said before the sons of the house of Rechabite, boils full of wine and cups. And I said to them, drink wine. Then the next verse. Verse 6. But they said, we will drink no wine. For Jonathan, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, you shall drink no wine. Wine. You, no, you, nor your sons forever. 
Praise the Lord. Did you see that? You know your songs forever. Okay, let's read verse 7. Uh, I think that's it. Okay, I think uh, that, that's, that's, the, that's the part I want to you know, emphasize on. You know, this was a commandment from their, from their own father. And the reason to, to begin to look at that, why would such a father give such instruction? Why would their father give such instruction that they should not drink wine? And not just for a period of time, but he said forever. Forever. You know? And as you look at that, people that, you know, are given that kind of instruction, purposely, if for what? If for a consecrated life, people that God will want to use, that God, that uh, God wants to consecrate for himself. And so, they were told not to drink wine. So, the, you know, the argument or the, you know, uh, the debate that we have now are this, is uh, whether not to take it or not to take, uh, whether to take it or not to take it. But if you look at those passages of the scriptures I've read, from Luke, from uh, Georges. And I said to all that, one, we will, we, uh, we will, or we should emulate. Because as you look at the reason why they were commanded not to do it, it was the purpose of consecration to God for them to be used of him. I think that our own, ourselves too, we are no better than them. If you want to, by the grace of God, to be used of God and to be consecrated to God, those are some of the demands. Those are some of the, the, the demands. And when Paul said that, present yourself, yourself as a living sacrifice, those are the sacrifices to pay. They are part of it. Not just all, also drinking of wine, but even our life will be a life of sacrifice unto God. And so if you look at it from that angle, that as a Christian, we are supposed to live a consecrated and dedicated life to God. Praise the Lord. So as a Christian, so if you, are, if you are to live a life that is consecrated and dedicated to God, and we look at it from that perspective, we know that all our life is to please who um, God has called us, is to allow the will of God to be done in our life. You know, uh, the debate of uh, whether drink or no drink should not be something that we begin to struggle with. So the uh, you know the summary is that God expects our life to be so that it is given totally to God, and that's why He also admonishes that instead of being drunk, you should be filled with the Spirit of God. We should be filled with the spirit of God. And so, uh, let me quickly read this other passage of scripture too. So for, for, for someone that wants to live a consecrated life, you know, we have, you know, nothing to do with... Uh, what we defile the temple of God. The Bible says that we should keep his temple pure. Our own body is God's temple. And we should not take in what we destroy God's temple. 
We should regard our body as the one that we present as a living sacrifice unto God. And that is the way we should conduct ourselves. That is the way we should conduct our life. You know, uh, re- going through from Genesis to, uh, you know, uh, Revelation, you will see how God has dealt with people that, is, that are consecrated to him. And so when we, le- when we look at their life and also what God demands of them, we know that for, for us to live a consecrated life, there is a price to pay. But what we often do is to look at ourselves and say, ah, at least other people are doing it. But it cannot be like that with us. And I give an example of the, you know, the priests of those days and those that, you know, the other people. That why will God say, okay, priest, don't do this kind of a thing. God have a reason. And the reason being that God said that these people are consecrated unto me. And they are also consecrated for God's service and for God's use. And I think that is the way we should portray ourselves. That is the way we should, you know, we should live our life. That our life is consecrated unto God. That in all that we do, that it brings glory to him. You know, for me, I will rather, you know, uh, fall in line or emulate, you know, scriptures and examples like that. Even though people will still go ahead and debate this and that. But it is very clear from the word of God that if, uh, you know, God have need of you and God is going to use you for his name and his glory, God will demand something from you. It will not be like every other people. There is a price to pay. It's just like you are, you are a disciple. There is a price of discipleship. There is a cost to it. And so if you look at it from that angle, from that perspective, you know that even our life as Christian, there is a price to pay for it. Even though Jesus paid the price, but we in abiding and following Christ to, you know, to fulfill and also to please him, there is a, pl- a price to pay. You know, we cannot do things like we other people do it. The one whom we want to please is our master. And remember I said that, he said that he's coming for a church that is what? That is without wrinkle and spotless. That our government should be presented in a way that is not tarnished. Praise the Lord. I think mommy wanted to make comment. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, any other comment before we close? Because of our time. Sorry? Oh, so what happened to them? <laughs> what happened to the bodies? Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, so any other comment contribution before we close tonight uh, before I call mommy to come up it just what okay you know um, well, let's just spend, spend some few minutes just to commit ourselves with the hand of God you know we need to ask for God's grace just like bro uh, Mike said he said the sober and be vigilant. The Christian life is not the life that's supposed to be careless. We need to be, Jesus said that we should watch and pray. So we cannot live a life that is careless. We have to be sober. He said because your adversary, the devil, is roaring about, looking for whom he might devour. 
And that's why in our Christian life, in our Christian work with God, we have to be cautious. We cannot live carelessly. We need to be, you know, we need to maintain our disciplined life as Christ follower, as the one that has come to believe on the Lord. And the way he wants us to live, we have to maintain that discipline. So I want us to just begin to further appreciate God for tonight. Let's begin to thank him for the word of God. Let's begin to appreciate it. Lord, we want to thank you because we know that there is light in your word. We know there is revelation in your word. We know that, Lord, that your word brings understanding. And so, Lord, we pray tonight, even as we have heard your word, as we have gone through the scripture, we have that more than what a man can explain. That, Lord, that you begin to interpret, you begin to speak to our heart in the name of Jesus. Lord, every area that concerns, that pertain unto us, you begin to speak to every individual in the name of Jesus. Where we need to make a change, where we need to make an amend, Lord, we ask, oh God, about your spirit. You begin to touch our life in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We bless your holy name. For in Jesus' name, we pray. And before we close, I just want us to lift up our voice and also commit our pastor into the hand of the Lord. Let's begin to tell the Lord that God will be with him wherever he is. The hand of God will rest upon his life in the name of Jesus. God will prosper him. You know, in an assignment that he has gone for, that the God will, God will make him to prosper. And he will bring him safely back unto us in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We bless your holy name. For in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's share the grace as we bring the service to a close. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the sweet fellowship of Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord.